Good afternoon, everyone. Um, everyone back from the break. Hopefully, we're, it's a 3.02, so we'll get going. My name is Christine Duhame. I'm a lawyer from uh, Vancouver, and I practice in Vancouver and uh, Toronto mostly. And um, with me is Nicholas. He'll let him say a few words. Hi, I'm Nicholas Christine. I'm a faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm perhaps the only computer scientist in the room. Um, hopefully, uh, my role here will become clear when, uh, when I talk in the second half of this panel. So welcome to the uh, Bitcoin session. Um, I'm going to go first and I'm going to provide a general overview of what Bitcoin is. But before I get uh, going, I'm just wondering if anyone here has ever bought Bitcoin from a show of hands. It's funny because when I talk in the States, usually everyone puts their hand up and in Canada, no one has yet. So this is kind of an interesting... Uh, Interesting uh, reaction, kind of a mixed. Um, anyway, I have bought Bitcoin, and part of my presentation is going to be on how I acquired it, um, because the way I acquired it raises some interesting financial crime questions. Um, so I'm your case study for today's talk on Bitcoin. So I'll just manage that. There we go. So that's sort of an overview. I'm going to talk a bit about Bitcoin generally, some of the legal risks, um, and it does actually have some interesting implications for financial crime prevention. And I'm going to talk about that at the end. And um, Canada is actually on track to be the first country to actually have Bitcoin uh, legislation in its federal law as opposed to guidance uh, in the U.S. So that's supposed to be in place by June, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So first of all, uh, what Bitcoin is, it is not, uh, I mean, most of you probably already know by now, but just for a quick overview, it's not actually a physical coin. It's just, uh, as Nicholas will probably explain more than, uh, more than I could do in, in any event, it is just a computer, what, a protocol, a p computer yeah, bit? It's, it's protocol. Uh, yeah, it's protocol, like your email um, system. Um, and it's on a public shared ledger uh, in the sense that all of the transactions and all of the history of Bitcoin is... Uh, accessible to everyone at any time to go in and have a look um, and right now it's an open source uh, software program and uh, it is surprisingly remarkably revolutionary and as I said I'm going to get a bit into that for the financial crime uh, prevention aspect of it that I think is where it's one of its big promises lies so it is used uh, or you know it mostly now as a as a currency um, although that may not be technically the correct word, that is how it's used. Uh, that's really how it was designed, is as a way of a medium of exchange so that you could buy goods and services uh, through the internet in a different way and without oversight of any regulatory body or any um, monetary system controlling the transactions. Um, so that is basically how it's being used now, but part of the innovative part of Bitcoin is uh, a lot of venture capital firms, especially here in the United States, are pouring vast amounts of money into moving Bitcoin forward as a network so that there are other applications for which it can be used beyond just a currency. Uh, so um, the last time I checked, Bitcoin was close to $400. I didn't check today, but it was $1,000 in November. So it has uh, extreme ups and downs, and one of the interesting things about it is only 21 million Bitcoin can ever be generated. Uh, but I think even that possibly can change in the future if the protocol gets revised, if it's revisable, which Nicholas will describe a bit more. Um, so with respect to the Bitcoin network, it was launched early 2009. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer type of communication. So when you acquire Bitcoin or sell it or do a Bitcoin transaction, it's between your computer and someone else's. So there's no oversight. There's no intervening computer. There's no one that's monitoring the transactions in the sense of a, a bank system or a bank transaction or any other type of online uh, purchase of goods and sales that you normally would see. There's no centralized servers that control it or oversee it or, or anything whatsoever. So in that sense, it is truly an independent type of uh, animal, very different than anything we've ever seen before in terms of a medium of exchange. So uh, quickly about Bitcoin wallets and addresses. In order to start to engage in the Bitcoin world, you need to have a Bitcoin address, uh, which we also call a wallet. And when you go online and you acquire a wallet, you get two things. You get a private key and you get a uh, public key. And in order to, normally people acquire their Bitcoin wallets through an app like on your cell phone or on your computer and that's where you store, if you want to use that word, or, or have the record of the fact that you own your Bitcoin. So as I said, the wallet or the address has the two parts of a private and a public a key, um, and they're sort of important from the consumer protection perspective, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, in order to, to use a Bitcoin, 
in a way that you may want to pay a merchant, all that you need to disclose or cough up, if you will, is the public address. So if you're going to buy something from overstock.com, which is a new merchant that accepts Bitcoin, you just need to provide them with your Bitcoin address um, so that they can extract the Bitcoin from you and you make your purchase. Now that's really different than how we make online transactions right now using your American Express card, for example, where if you wanted to uh, buy something online using your American Express card, you'd obviously give your number, your name, your address probably, that four-digit code um, that American Express has, and then that would all be ID'd through the American Express system, and you could go ahead and give your and have your purchase approved. So what's different about that in Bitcoin is that with Bitcoin, all you've given overstock.com, for example, is your public address, nothing personal, and nothing private, not your private key. So um, with American Express, there's some security there, but there's also a uh, lack of potential lack of privacy. There's uh, the fact that you've handed over everything that a fraudster can use in the future to use your credit card to make another transaction. With Bitcoin, there's a little bit more security because all you've handed over is that public key. And no one can take your Bitcoin out unless they have the private key.